Welcome to A House Divided, coming to you from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, our guest is David Rubenstein. My name is Bjorn Skaptesen, and I am simply administering this uh, conversation. The conversation will be between Daniel Weinberg, owner of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and David Rubenstein, and they will discuss David's new book, How to Lead. Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs, Founders, and Game Changers. This book will be available from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and we will put a link to where you can order it uh, in this video. And when we share this video on Facebook, we will also place a link in the comments on Facebook so that you can order the book while you are watching. You can also order the book after this program is over. The books we have are first editions of How to Lead, and Mr. Rubenstein has very graciously signed book plates that we can provide for you so that you will have a signed first edition of How to Lead. So with no more further ado from me, let me turn this program over to Daniel Weinberg, your host, and he will introduce you to David Rubenstein. Thank you, Bjorn. We are here uh, at the studio, at least two of us are, and we wish David was. David had been here earlier this year with his uh, other book, The American Story, but I'm glad you're here today. Uh, David, of course, is co-founder and co-executive chairman of the equity firm, the Carlisle Group. He's chairman of the board of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Smithsonian Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's a trustee at the National Gallery of Art, University of Chicago, where he graduated from law school, and many other institutions. He's the host of the David Rubenstein Show on Bloomberg TV, and he's the recipient of the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy as well. He's the author, as I mentioned, of The American Story, Conversations with Master Historians. You can see that right there in back of me, and we still have first editions with uh, directly signed by uh, David. So if you want one of those, we have those for you still as well. His latest book, as Bjorn said, is How to Lead, Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs, Founders, and Game Changers. Simon & Schuster publication, 424 pages, and costs $30. And David, I've got to say, I have got to start, that I'm so happy to see a comma here in the list of words. Uh, if, uh, it's not an optional, it's clarity as far as I'm concerned. And I know commas aren't used as much before ands anymore, but I'm happy to say that here it was. So, you know, last time when you were here, you told me you read about one to two books a week. So with all your leadership and philanthropy roles, how do you find time for the solitary practice? Are you a swift reader as John Kennedy was? Well, I don't drink alcohol, so that doesn't consume a lot of time. I don't play golf, so there's no, there's a lot of time I save there. And of course, <laughs> um, now in my home, uh, almost uh, you know, around the clock, so I'm not traveling so much, so there's no interruption there. But uh, the truth is, I do read an enormous amount of books because I enjoy it. And so it's not work, it's pleasure. And I am reading books on things I know something about already, history, biography, uh, politics, uh, business, and so forth. If I had to read a physics textbook or a chemistry textbook, you know, it would take me about three years to get through it. So I'm <laughs> reading things I know something about. And I wouldn't say I'm a speed reader, but I, you know, I know a fair bit about the subject already, so I can get through it pretty quickly. Now, Walter Isaacson, who's on the back of your jacket here, uh, with an enthusiastic review, was on our show a number of years ago with his book, Innovations. And he's, he taught me, certainly, that innovation requires the humanities. What role does education and the humanities in particular have in the success of leadership? Uh, many in your book stress education. Well, to me, um, being educated is one of the great uh, necessities of life if you're really going to be successful in what you're doing. There, there are a few people from time to time who are not educated and don't care about books and don't care about learning and so forth and they somehow rise to the top of some organizations, and uh, that happens from time to time. 
but the odds are mostly in favor of people who are educated. And I would say that education is not getting a degree from someplace. It's working your entire life to improve your brain and learn more and more. I tell college students or students whenever I give a commencement address, you've just the beginning of your education process. And sadly, as you probably know, there is a phenomenon called illiteracy in the United States where people who can read don't read. And 30% of people that graduate from college never read another book in their life. That's a sad situation. And roughly 50% of Americans have not bought a book or been in a bookstore in the last five years. Another but the humanities are important, aren't they? Themselves? Think, well, STEM is important. And uh, I think I recognize why people care about STEM. But in the end, humanities are the things that make us different from other species in many ways. Uh, you know, the humans have, when humans came on the face of the earth, I don't imagine the other species looked at us and said, hey, these people are going to conquer the earth. They're going to rule the, the world. They didn't think that because we were smaller, not as fast, not as strong, and so forth. But because we have this brain, we were able ultimately to rule the earth for better or worse. And I think one of the reasons uh, that humans have advanced so much is because they learn how to uh, do things in expressing themselves in the arts, architecture, art, uh, visual arts, uh, performing arts, reading, writing. And these are the, the humanities that I think are so important to making humanity uh, important. So what's the point of being a human if you have no interest in anything that human uh, you know, brain has achieved over the years? Amen. And, it's, and learning is not just for a job. It's also to feed one's soul. Well, let um, me comment on that. I, I don't want to interrupt you. I, I agree with that. Do. But here's the, here's the point that I, I think is important. Unfortunately, um, many people say, well, why should somebody go to college if he or she is really not that uh, great a student? Or why should he or she go to college if they can get a job as a plumber or as a worker that doesn't require a college degree and they get a nice blue collar job? The point of getting an education is not to make money. It can help you do that. But the point of education is to improve your brain and your life. And so if you go to college and you become a plumber afterwards, nothing wrong with that. But you hopefully you'll learn how to enjoy books, theater, opera, uh, shows. You'll learn how to read better. And, and, and that's the point of going to college and getting educated. It's not just to make money. Now, uh, this book, uh, actually, before I get to it, you have some wonderful illustrations throughout the book of each of the interviewees. Uh, why did you use almost like woodcuts, they're wonderful, uh, but uh, instead of a photograph. Who did well, those, those yeah, it, it, It's tempting to say that um, I uh, thought it was a great idea and I came up with the idea. I did not. Uh, Simon & Schuster had an artist. Um, he was given an opportunity to, to look at the people who were in the book and he, he came up with the, the, uh, the um, kind of car, the, 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 the uh, uh, not calligraphy, but the, uh, the uh, way he characterized them. And it was very well done, I thought. And I think it's uh, something I wish I could do. I don't have that kind of skill set. But I think- No, no, I, but they're beautiful. They really do. They find the gestalt of the person. Right, so I think it worked pretty well and, and people recognize themselves. And so I think it worked, it worked well. So I, I now can't- Now these interviews, these interviews that you had were mainly through peer-to-peer -peer interviews that you had on Bloomberg over the years. Um, you had to edit on uh, your last, your last work, you had to edit those down. I presume you had to edit these a bit? Yes. Um, the interviews on, on Bloomberg show, about 45 minutes. We edited it down on the TV show to about uh, 25 minutes or so, something like that. And then um, for the book, though, we edited it slightly differently because sometimes some things might work on a TV show and some things might not. And so I kind of edited it down with the help of an editor that I have. Uh, we edited it down. So, um, yeah, and it's designed to make people want to read the entire interview. As you know, uh, when you read an interview, it can be boring if it's not, doesn't have a certain pace to it, doesn't have some humor in it, doesn't have some human interest stories in it. So I tried to make it one that people would want to read each of the interviews. And the advantage of it is you don't have to read one from the start to the finish in terms of the whole book. Right. You can pick one person you like in the back of the book, in the middle of the book and so forth. And so that way uh, people kind of enjoy it that way as well. One of the things I enjoyed about this is not just about leadership. Uh, they're almost mini biographies as well. Uh, they reveal more than just leadership. It gives an inside look at how each of these people approach their jobs and some of the inner workings of their jobs that we usually don't see. Uh, it shows the myriad paths people take 
to success, the hard work that it takes. And I think it gives people outside of them hope that they also can be aspiring leaders and be successful, not just monetarily, in life. Well, that was what I was trying to accomplish to some extent. I wasn't trying to say to people who are my age, 71, read this book and you'll be a leader when you haven't been a leader of your previous life, part of your life. But I was trying to say to young people, look, you can be a leader. Look at some of the examples of these people who failed early in life. They overcame that. And I wanted to point out as well that I was no great leader early on in my life. I got lucky later on life. And I was trying to point out that even though you might be a Rhodes Scholar or Supreme Court clerk, there's no guarantee that later in life you'll be a star or a great leader unless you keep working at it. And in fact, the people that run the country and run the world very often were not stars early on. Well, let me ask you this. I don't see this as a how-to book, but it certainly can help. Uh, can leadership be taught? Uh, what's the audience for this book? I don't think you can read a book and all of a sudden you're going to turn out to be Abraham Lincoln. I, I don't think that happens. I think you have to, um, you can be inspired to, uh, by reading a book and maybe get some ideas, but in the end, you have to put in the hard work and, 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 and all the things necessary to become a leader. And I tried in the, in the beginning of the book to say, these are certain qualities that these leaders have in common. Failure, they have uh, ability to communicate, share the credit, integrity. Um, they have uh, also a fo ability to focus, ability to, to uh, uh, communicate well with other people. And they also have, in my view, a very important virtue, humility. Yes, we're going to get to all of those, actually, or numbers of them. Um, how did you pick your interviewees for the book? Uh, and how did you prepare for each person or each category, for that matter? I'll talk about the categories in a moment. Uh, the Bloomberg show has been on for about five years or so, and I probably interviewed about 150 people. So I had to you know, figure out what would be an appropriate cross-section. So I didn't want to have all political leaders or all military leaders or all people in business. So it was a cross-section. Obviously, I wanted to reflect some diversity of the population we have, and so I, I did that as well. And then uh, the publisher and I went over uh, who would be a good fit and so forth, and we put them into various categories. It's a little bit of an artificial categorization. I mean, somebody could be in one category, another category. That wasn't the most important thing. What I really hoped is that people would read the story and recognize that most people realize they got lucky in life, that certain circumstances happened they couldn't have anticipated, and then they worked through those, and then sometimes they failed, and then they came back. And ultimately, they became prominent people. And their stories are ones I hope will inspire other people to want to be a leader. And why should somebody want to be a leader? Why should somebody want to be a leader? Well, I think it makes you feel better as a human, feel you're accomplishing something, it makes you feel better about what you're doing on the face of the earth. But also, you can make the world a better place if you're a leader and you get great things done. I, I would also say, ask, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't want to step on you. Uh, but let me ask you this. Um, not all people aspire to be leaders. Some are don't maybe don't have the skills to do that or haven't acquired them. Some just will be followers. Well, what can followers of leaders learn from this book? Well, of course, you know, when we think of leaders, we often think about kind of famous people, the ones I've talked about in this book. But in many ways, almost everybody in the face of the earth is a leader to some extent. If you're a parent, you're a leader. Um, if you might be a leader in your neighborhood, you might be a, a a school teacher, everybody is probably leading somebody in some respects, but you know, not everybody, of course. Uh, why should somebody uh, want to be a follower rather than a leader? Well, some people may not have the personality to really want to be a leader. They don't want to take on the work, the responsibility, and so forth. There's nothing wrong with being a follower. It's my view, though, that if you're a leader in any given area, it could be a, your neighborhood association, a PTA, whatever it might be, you're likely to feel better about yourself. You're likely to feel you're accomplishing more as a human, and you may help other people become better people as a result. Well, you, you put, I'm just going to read these kind of quickly, the 13 attributes that you saw, maybe through yourself, uh, as leadership qualities and that you see in many others in the book. Just quickly, and we'll talk about some of them in more detail. Luck, desire to succeed, pursuit of something new and unique, hard work and long hours, focus, failure, persistence, persuasiveness, humble demeanor, which you've talked about, credit sharing, the ability to keep learning, integrity, responding to a crisis. All of these are attributes that you see uh, in, in leaders. They don't all have all of them, but 
are there common threads that you see in the leaders that at least are in this book? Well, many of the leaders have those traits. Um, and people have asked me all the time, well, can't you be arrogant and be a leader? And I suspect, uh, you know, I suspect that Napoleon was arrogant. I didn't ever interview him. I suspect Julius Caesar was not modest and humble. Alexander the Great attached the great to his name. I suspect he wasn't that humble. However, the people that you most admire probably uh, have a fair amount of humility. And humility has become a more important virtue in the last couple hundred years. I would say maybe a thousand years ago, it wasn't uh, considered such a virtue, uh, it, though it should have been. But take a person you know very well. Abraham Lincoln. I can't imagine Abraham Lincoln sitting around at the, at the White House saying, you know what, I just won the Civil War. Didn't have any help, did it by myself. You know, I, I, I kind of uh, did all these things by myself. I just can't see him doing that. In fact, I can't even remember all the things I've read about Lincoln, who's ever bragging about almost anything. Yeah, yeah, he was humble. Uh, but uh, uh, let me ask you a question from, I mean, that must be one of the most difficult things to achieve maybe, this humbleness, especially when you have success, middle management even, no matter where you are, and that can go to one's head a bit. It's hard to be humble sometimes. You have to have ego though, don't you, to achieve? Well, I think you have to feel you have something to contribute, but that doesn't mean you have to be arrogant. Uh, if you sit no. down with Warren Buffett, you know, he's not gonna tell you I'm the greatest investor in the history of the world. Uh, he would make jokes about his uh, mistakes or something like that. And I do think that humility is a, a virtue that others admire. Arrogance is not admired. Some people become, you know, leaders with arrogance. In the end, they're not the kind of leaders I most admire. And I tell people, if you aren't really that humble and you can't make yourself humble, maybe you could fake it a little bit. It's better to pretend you're humble than being arrogant, because I do think people like people who are humble because they really, um, you know, sympathize with their overcoming have the mistakes they might have made in life, and they now get to the place where they're very prominent, and now they don't brag about it. I think it's it's very good. These attributes that I just read off, uh, they are skills. And are some of these learned skills, are some of them innate skills? <clears throat> what percent would you think are learned versus innate? Because DNA does differentiate people. Not everyone has the exact same abilities, abilities that are created equally. Yes, I mean, the concept that, that this country was founded on was theoretically that everybody was equal. But that really means, as we've now evolved it, uh, everybody has, should have an equal opportunity. But we recognize everybody isn't completely equal at both, birth. For example, if your mother and father were both all American uh, athletes, it's more likely than not you'll probably have some athletic skills, uh, maybe because they nurture you young or, or, or you just have very good you know, uh, body, I'd say. If both of your parents won Nobel Prizes in science, you're probably gonna be reasonably good in science. But beyond those kind of things, it's not the case that if your father was Douglas MacArthur, that you're gonna grow up to be a general yourself. It's not always the case that being prominent in a certain area produces kids who have those same skill sets as their parents. So I think it's a matter of evolution. It's a matter of learning. It's a matter of desiring to learn. And, and basically the, the key time to do that is in the first third of your life. I like to point out in the book that I didn't start Carlisle, which became successful until I was 37. I tell people, young students all the time, experiment, try many different things, find something you love. Nobody ever won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. You have to love it. I didn't love some of the things I did. I moved into other things. You know, you obviously love uh, your bookstore, right? And so it's a passion uh, for you and you're great at it. And you have to love something like that to really make it work. So what are the different types of leadership briefly? Maybe what's your definition of leadership? And what types do you see? Some must persuade like Nancy Pelosi in this book. Others are more solitary leaders like maybe Jack Nicholson leading by example. Uh, some who are not even the boss, but need still need to, be, need to be leaders, such as maybe James Baker is an example. What are the different hues and forms of leadership? Well, different skill sets that people have, but in the end, to be a leader, you have to have followers. How do you get followers? Well, you have to communicate what you want them to do to follow you. There are three really good ways to do that. One is to be a great orator. So I am, you know, Martin Luther King was a great speech maker, among other things and he could get people to follow him. You could be a great uh, writer. Uh, you could be Abraham Lincoln. You write the Gettysburg Address. People are persuaded perhaps by the brilliance of that, uh, those 200 and 
uh, plus words. So uh, that's another way. But the most effective way to be a leader and communicate what you want people to do is not by oral communication or written. It's by example. You do what you want other people to do, and they will follow you. So George Washington stayed with his troops in Valley Forge in 1777. He could have gone to the Four Seasons or the Ritz-Carlton down the street. He didn't do that. He stayed with his troops to show, I'm willing to suffer just as you are. Now, he was in a slightly different situation than the worst of the troops in terms of having clothing and so forth, but he stayed with the troops. So leading by example is the most effective way to really get people to follow you. Do what you want people to do, and they will follow you. Do most leaders in your book, for instance, have mentors that help foster them? Is there kind of a cauldron that uh, a mentor can give you? Almost everybody uh, who gets anywhere has some mentor. Some are really close, some are not as close, but everybody has, when they're young, looks up to some people, and they may or may not be mentors, they may be role models, but as you get older, you'll get people who might mentor you, and I think it's a very important thing if you can get mentors. Sometimes it's not as easy to get people to give you the time that you might want, but I do think it's important. What about vision? How important is that? Now, that was the vision thing that uh, George W.H. Bush spoke about. Uh, can one develop vision, uh, such as Richard Branson did with space? I don't think he had that when he first came into any business, but that's a vision that came to him. Uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, in your book, uh, says we even are, have to articulate that vision to make it succeed. Vision comes from uh, having ideas and you want to ultimately express those ideas to other people. Uh, very few people have, are born with a brilliant vision of what they want to do, or even in their, their teenage years. That happens rarely. So Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, they dropped out of Harvard to pursue their vision. But it's generally not the case. Generally, visions come along later in life, and then people uh, follow those people who have a vision, if those people can communicate the vision to people. Uh <clears throat> Becoming a leader can be time consuming. And does one have to give up certain parts of one's life? Let's take Lincoln. He, to become that leader, he was on circuit and away from his family for months. Does one have to give up certain things in one's life to really be a successful leader? Well, there's no doubt that being a leader uh, takes time, just like anything worth having in life takes time. So I think it's a matter of uh, balancing things. Most of the people that I've written about in this book or that I interviewed, they have given up certain things that they maybe wish they could do, more leisure activities. But on the whole, I think that the fact that they became leaders has given them greater pleasure out of life than playing another round of golf or, or shooting another animal in, in a hunting uh, effort. So I think uh, generally uh, you can figure out how to balance things. Now, I don't think it's good to work around the clock. I think you have to have some balance. But I do think you have to recognize that hard work is necessary and you can't become a great leader nine to five, five days a week. You have to spend more time at it. Well, some people say that successful people and hardworking people create their own luck. We talk about luck. Right, right. Uh, is, it, is that true in your estimation? They can create your own luck, maybe by even just taking chances, which you must need to do at, at times. Uh, well, luck is something I think you do help create. In other words, if you sit in your home all day, you're not gonna meet anybody, you don't talk to anybody, you're not reading anything, you're just sitting there watching television or something, you're not probably gonna make the contacts that might be helpful to you. Almost everybody has had somebody who hired them or somebody who gave them a job or somebody who bought their product or service. How do you meet those people? Well, you have a contact that leads you to one thing to another thing, it's a lot of luck. Most people meet their spouses by luck. If they hadn't gone to one party or they hadn't been introduced by somebody, they wouldn't have married that person. It's a lot of luck and that's what life is. But you can make your own luck. And I think if you're really a smart person, you often are looking out for opportunities to meet people, to find different experiences, and that can, in the end, turn out to be great luck. One has to have one's eyes open positively. Uh, we spoke, you spoke a bit about confidence and uh, uh, how one needs that. Uh, does one, does many leaders have adversity to overcome that helps confidence? Well, almost every leader has overcome adversity. I interviewed a person about leadership just yesterday uh, or Sunday. Uh, it was um, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who wrote a book about leadership in turbulent times. And uh, she pointed out that all the people she wrote about had adversity. So Teddy Roosevelt had his wife and his mother die the same day in the same house. Abraham Lincoln uh, went through depression, as you know, over some personal matters. Um, and when, when, for example, one of his girlfriends, I guess, uh, died 
he went through a Great Depression, among other uh, things, that he was fairly depressed and it overcame that. So uh, FDR obviously had polio, and that was uh, a matter that created some depression over a period of time. And uh, Lyndon Johnson lost an election, and that put him into you know, a psychic depression for a while. So those are kind of things that people overcome. And yes, almost everybody's overcome something serious in their life that kind of set them back for a while. What about criticism? Uh, how it's important to uh, handle criticism, both just and unjust. How do leaders usually do that? So nobody really likes to be criticized. But as you get more experience, you realize you're not perfect. And you realize that some people are going to say things that, that you might not like, particularly in politics, uh, for example. But in the end, I think most people who are leaders are, are self-confident enough that they feel that they can overcome the criticisms and they recognize that there might be some validity in some of the criticisms, but they have to plow forward and just can't listen to what everybody says that's negative or you'd never get anything done. And they also have to adapt. You have to have some resiliency. Uh, speak about Nancy Pelosi in this book from your interview, fascinating interview, and also mentions how uh, congressmen, when they first came in, used to be when they were new, they'd be quiet, they'd be backbenchers, they'd learn. Now they come in and they almost immediately want to be heard. And so there has to be resiliency to leaders uh, and how to adapt to circumstances. Well, there used to be a tradition in the United States Senate, you didn't, spoke, you didn't speak on the floor of the Senate for one year, one year. Now I think it's about one hour. So yeah. you know, people, people don't, it's not the same as before. And, and look, um, throughout history, uh, people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s will say to the younger generation, uh, we were better than you, we were smarter than you, we worked harder than you, your generation's going to pot. Um, but this has been going on for thousands of years and presumably will go on for thousands of years. Every new generation comes on and does things differently. So it might be that spe not speaking for a year wasn't a good idea. So there are always changes, and I think changes usually are brought about by younger people. I don't remember the Roman senator who... Uh... I read in the history, but it's been, you know, two lifetimes ago, that was decrying the generation behind him. So I always think if that Roman center was at the apex of humanity and everyone, every generation after that is downhill slide, oh, that's awful. That's, that keeps me focused. Well, it's true. I mean, there's a story that George Washington's father used to say to him, your generation is going nowhere. You guys don't work as hard. I can't imagine what your generation is going to produce. You know, this is like, this is going on all the time. I want to go back to Eagle for a moment because Tim Cook in, in, in the book uh, speaks about that, or you speak about it, that you found Tim Cook uh, the lowest ego, self-effacing CEO you've met. But how important is that? I, I still think that one needs to feel that you can achieve. You certainly have an achievement gene in you. Well, everybody has an ego, and some people's ego is uh, more visible than other people. Tim Cook has an ego, but he's able to, in effect, sublimate it a bit because he recognizes that somebody else built the company initially, and he was the genius, Steve Jobs, and his job is to follow the vision of Steve. And if, if he tried to be like Steve Jobs, it wouldn't work. He, that's not his personality. So he recognized his strength was management, cooperation, supply chain, things like that. And it was different than Steve, but it worked out extremely well. When Steve Jobs died, uh, he was, uh, the, the market cap of the company was about $350 billion. Now it's about $2 trillion. The company's market value is up six times. So obviously, Tim Cook has done a very good job, but he doesn't go out and try to brag about it. He's very modest and unassuming, as are many people who have accomplished things that are worth talking about. So you speak about... Um... Uh, maybe aggression of, of someone that they can really be uh, bad people from that ego can go to, but ego can also morph into just plain hubris. Uh, you can still be nice and good, but have hubris. How does a leader puncture that bubble so that they can have a humility and understanding with their ego and not become that? Well, hubris is uh, an ancient Greek word that really essentially means uh, an overweening ego, um, and, and you just don't believe that you could do anything wrong. Uh, there are leaders that have that uh, effect. You, you, know, you and I have probably read about some of them or probably know some of them, and there are probably some you know, well-known people who have hubris. 
I think generally to overcome it, it's helpful to have a partner, perhaps a spouse that might be helpful. Children can usually puncture hubris a bit. A strong-willed partner in a business context might help. But in the end, if somebody has enormous amounts of hubris, it's probably not going to go away until he or she has a chance to fall flat on their face and to see that they've made some mistakes, pick themselves up, but with less hubris than before. You talk about specialty in here. Uh, and do leaders in the book think of themselves as specialists? Tim Cook suggests, again, we'll use him, uh, that one should become an expert in a field before we're going on to the next. I think you agree with that. Uh, does one's mind become polluted if you try to go in too many directions at once? Diluted, I mean, not polluted, diluted. If you say at the beginning of your career, I'm gonna be an expert in five things, 10 things, 20 things, 30 things, you'll have very little chance of being an expert in anything because you're so diluted. So I tell people, and Tim Cook said the same thing, so did Eric Schmidt in the book, find something that makes that your own, make yourself an expert in it. And when after you've made yourself an expert, somebody will say, Joe Blow is an expert in A, area A. He might be an area, an expert as well in area A plus. So he, since he did such a good job in area A, let me give him a chance in area A plus. And if you good, do a good job in area A plus, they might say, he might do a good in A++. And you kept getting different things. So you build your little power base in the organization by being good at one thing, focusing it, and then ultimately you, you expand your expertise. So Tim Cook was a supply chain expert. He had been doing that at, at IBM. I was recruited to Compaq. He didn't go there. He went to Apple mostly to become the, uh, build the supply chain. And that's what he was an expert on. Later, he developed other areas of expertise. Um. Men and women are different. Uh, we've seen Kamala Harris on the debate stage, and she has been judged by some on how she is perceived as a woman and reacts, et cetera. Objectively, in our society, it seems to be, and maybe many societies, there seem to be different expectations for men and women. So do the, are there other necessary skill sets that are needed for men or, or women, really, in different respects. Did Oprah or Ruth Bader Ginsburg or uh, uh, Mrs. Gates, Linda Gates, speak of this? Did any of the women speak about what they needed to have as leaders different than others, maybe, in your book? Well, I think throughout history, and I mean millions of years of history, uh, it's clear that uh, women and men have been held to different standards. So now in the year 2020, we have not completely abs absolved ourselves from that prejudice. And women do have tougher standards to meet in certain contexts. So I think as a general rule of thumb, in the business world, a woman probably has to be tougher than a man in some cases, has to be smarter than a man, has to do things that some men can't do because men are gonna judge them more harshly, I think, than they would judge uh, themselves or other men. So that's just a fact of life. Women who I've written about in the book or who did the interviews with the book have recognized that. Um, and, and very often women have a, 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 a challenge. Um, a good example is uh, the, the issue with children. Uh, many of the women who become CEOs, they sometimes didn't have children or they had a husband who was willing to help raise those children or stay at home. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg said she was blessed with having a husband who believed that child rearing was a responsibility of both parents equally, which is rare. True. Uh, now, you have various categories in the book, six of them, visionaries, builders, transformers, commanders, decision makers, and masters. Now, it's in, you have various people in each one. Uh, are there skill sets that might define each particular category, and can a cat and can a leader in one category, as I think you alluded to earlier, be successful in more than one of those categories. It's possible. Remember, we came up with these categories because it was an easier way to kind of describe people in some ways. If I said, here's 31 interviews, um, it would be maybe a little bit harder for people to get their hands around it. So we have these categories, but there's no doubt that somebody can be a visionary and a builder at the same time. Bill Gates is a classic example. Brilliant man, and he had the vision for software being in the, the, the the future, but he also helped build Microsoft into, into incredible power. Um, same would be with Steve Jobs. So you can be in uh, different categories. 
but there's no doubt that some categories require uh, more solitary work by yourself. So if you're an opera singer, uh, you can have good teachers, but you have to deliver uh, the arias yourself. If you're uh, Yo-Yo Ma, it's good to have teachers and so forth, but working with a big team isn't gonna produce great uh, playing of the cello. So it's a little bit different when you're quote a master. Yeah, and, and certainly in an art versus perhaps business or science. Uh, various leaders in here, I'm just gonna go through very quickly some of them, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, various leaders, they almost all stress education, of course, as we spoke about. Many also focus on the long run and the necess necessity to be in that. Uh, Richard Branson uh, of the Virgin Group uh, says a willingness to change course and surrounded by good innovative people was, in was necessary. Jeff Bezos, willing to make mistakes and also to be a workaholic in his case. Phil Knight of Nike said good luck and timing, perhaps with Michael Jordan coming up at the moment help, uh, willing to work hard and long again. Ken Griffin from the Citadel uh, group said also talks of importance of timing and hiring those with passions. He's not the only one who said that. Uh, Jamie Dimon, working hard, surrounding himself with talented people. Eric Schmidt of Google, love what you do. Become an expert in one field, he said that, and then go on to the next. Um, now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, did it, does it by number of ways, but in the end, I see it as inspiration for her because not many of us will go and read one of her briefs. Uh, we see the outcome of her briefs. We don't really read them, but the inspiring part of her. You know, you started out, I'm gonna say this, you started out with your, with your interview with her. This is, uh, I forgot a couple of years before this, uh, and that the American, many people were uh, make, asking, uh, praying that her well-being right. continue. It reminded me of Calvin Coolidge, who was in the Oval Office with uh, William Bora, Senator from Idaho back in the 20s. And he had uh, seen, Coolidge had seen Vice President Dawes across the street on Pennsylvania Avenue and said, there goes the Vice President with nothing on his mind but my health. And right. that's maybe what we were for Ruth Ginsburg. Uh, but besides those briefs, she was a unique leader for being in her position that you have in this book, I think. Talk about that usefulness of inspiration and how she did that and what she said about it. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Yes. Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a woman who had a lot of discrimination against her because she was Jewish. She was uh, having children when she was looking for jobs, which wasn't considered appropriate then, and she was a woman. Uh, she overcame all that and basically became the, the person who I think transformed the law with respect to gender equality. But she um, had a lot of, you know, um, uh, detractors and along the way. People thought she was pushing things too far. Other people think she wasn't pushing them far enough. Uh, today, uh, we idolize her in part because she did transform the law. She wrote brilliant opinions, certainly in dissent many times, and, and the law ultimately went in her favor. And But also, I think in the last couple of years, she had four bouts of cancer. She came back to work each time. And she had a, uh, a kind of a fitness instructor who got her doing all kinds of exercise. And people kind of called her ultimately the notorious RBG because she was this diminutive person, 100 pounds, that's it. And she was working out, overcoming cancer, going to the opera, uh, an incredible life story. And uh, it, it's quite amazing what she achieved. And I interviewed her when she was about, I guess, maybe a year and a half or so before she died. And the question you referred to at the beginning, I said, how does it feel to have 330 million people I want to know about the state of your health when you work up, wake up every morning. And she said, yeah, and half of them don't really want it to be the way I want it to be. Yeah, right. It's true. Uh, I'm, because of this, what we've just been talking about, I'm going to ask you this question because Ruth Bader Ginsburg's interview was this to me. Uh, it's like asking which of your children you like best. Right. right. So uh, what, which one of these interviews maybe especially turned your head? and especially got your own juices going without disrespecting any of the others. Remember, I knew a lot of these people or know, know a lot of these people quite well. So some of the things were not surprising that they said, but 
uh, probably the most exciting of the interviews was uh, when I interviewed Jeff Bezos. We had about 2,000 people in the audience. It was the, a big anniversary for the Economic Club of Washington, where I've been the president. And people wanted to know where he was moving the second headquarters, because there was a rumor it was going to be in Washington. And so, of course, I was trying or to- Or Chicago. Tease, or Chicago. Uh, I was trying to tease it out of him, and he didn't quite say it. Uh, but it was, it was, you know, he has a great sense of humor. And it was a very funny interview. Uh, and one of the things that I, um, you know, learned in the interview was, which I wish I'd known before, is he gets eight hours of sleep every night. And I just think to myself, wow, if I'd known that, I would have gotten more sleep over the years and I would be more successful. He also said he doesn't make any big decisions before 10 a.m. I wish I'd known that. I wouldn't have gone to breakfast meetings all my life. So, you know, he had a lot of good insights, but very funny, self-deprecating. And, you know, you want a leader you know, that has that skill. Think about this. Throughout most of uh, organized history, the wealthiest people in the world, certainly the wealthiest people in the United States, they became reclusive. John D. Rockefeller, Howard Hughes. J. Paul Getty, um, Dan Ludwig. These were multi-billionaire people, or the equivalent at the time, but they didn't want to deal with other people because they were afraid of maybe their safety or they, people wanted money from them. Now you've got people like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, the wealthiest people in the United States and the wealthiest people in the world. They're out there doing interviews. They're out there laughing at themselves. They're trying to solve social problems. It's a big change from years ago. Yo-Yo Ma, you spoke of before, he said a very interesting thing. He's, he said, winning awards is fabulous because it gives you more chance to do something that you might wish to do. Do others feel that way? Did any of them speak about awards? Well, there's no doubt that if you are well known, it gives you a platform to do other things. Uh, we've seen that with Hollywood stars all the time. They often have social causes that people wouldn't uh, pay that much attention to if it wasn't for the fact that they were a movie star. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the way you know, people often get more attention because they're famous in one other area. In Yo-Yo Ma's case, he's the leading cellist in the world, I would say, certainly the most famous cellist in the world. And I would say that he uses that to spread the importance of arts around the world. So he's a cultural ambassador, and he likes to talk about the value of arts to humanity, not just his cello playing. And I think that's a very good thing for him to be able to do. And other people have the same kind of thing. Uh, many people get involved in certain philanthropic causes because people will listen to them because of what they've done elsewhere and they can really benefit the philanthropic cause. Um, let's talk about emotions for a moment. Emotions are really impulses to act. <clears throat> so how important is emotional intelligence and self-control <clears throat> and, so, and introspection uh, important to leadership and perhaps to the leaders that you speak interview in this book. Uh, do any of those speak to that? Well, there's a distinction some people would make between IQ and EQ. And I would say it's good to have a reasonable IQ, but being a genius doesn't necessarily guarantee you uh, great success. You know, all of us have known geniuses in our course of our lives, colleges or in high school, they were geniuses. But in the end, how many of them really turned out to be great? Some of them, but not that many. People that have good EQ, emotional uh, quotient, they are people that know how to get along with people, that know how to motivate people, they know how to read pe what people are thinking. Those are the people who are probably gonna get along. Now, if you find somebody that's got great IQ and EQ, that person's gonna be a real superstar, but usually those, those packages don't come together in, in quite that, that fashion. Do, um, in, the, in the interviews in this book, uh, do any of them speak more emotionally than in a, uh, analytically, they probably have different personalities to do that, but which ones would you say spoke uh, more from the heart, perhaps? Not that that's better than not. Most people are emotional when they talk about their parents. They talk about, um, let's say, having a poverty type upbringing. They talk about overcoming real discrimination in life, uh, all kinds of abuses they might have uh, felt. But very rarely does somebody say, I really hated my parents. My parents really prevented me from getting anywhere. And I really did it all on myself. And many times people like to talk about their um, failures because it kind of shows a certain humanity and what they've learned from it. And many of them can tear up when they're, when they're doing that. Now there's stress in leadership. Uh, how do they manage stress? What escapes? Do most of them have to have outside interest that they can go to uh, in times of stress just to forget reality for a moment? 
almost everybody has some outlet. It can be um, a sport, a hobby, um, things like that. Uh, some people just like to go away and read. Some people like to uh, uh, exercise, get away from it all, uh, have nobody be able to talk to them for a while. I think everybody needs to kind of charge down a bit. And I think the best leaders are people that know how to do that. Um, you know, Jim Baker, as a good example, uh, Jim Baker, uh, I was interviewing uh, the authors of a book about him recently that just came out. Uh, it was Peter, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. And it's a wonderful book. I think it should win a Pulitzer Prize. It's a ter terrific book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, we had a Zoom book party, about 900 people, some of the most prominent people in the United States who known Jim Baker and so forth were on it. And where was Jim Baker? Well, he had been ill for a while. And when he recovered, he said, hey, I want to go out and elk hunt. So he went elk hunting. He's 90 years old. So rather than go to a book party that was going to celebrate him, he said, no, I'd rather have the, the pleasure of elk hunting, which wouldn't be so pleasurable to me. But, but he liked it. So that's where he went. And a lot of people have those kind of outside interests. <clears throat> I may mess up this the pronunciation of the name of uh, Ginny Rometty. Uh, Ginny Rometty. Rometty. I didn't know where the syllable was. Right. So she spoke of hiring and looking for a trait, curiosity. Comment on curiosity and leadership and what they, and not only in themselves, but in what they like to see in others. Well, yes, I would say she was one person who was really emotional about talking about her upbringing in a sense. Um, her mother and father had, I think, four children. And then the father left the, the mother with essentially no money. And so they basically were on, I think, food stamps for a while or the equivalent of that. And so they really had to struggle for a while and ultimately through scholarships and so forth, she moved forward. Um, she's a person who, she stepped down as a CEO of IBM um, since the book came out or before the book came out, slightly before the book came out, but after I interviewed her. But she's a person that really likes people that uh, were very inquisitive when she interviewed them. And she's a person that overcame a lot of prejudice herself. Think about it. IBM was one of the biggest companies in the United States and it never had a woman as a CEO. And she overcame all those barriers and became the first female to be the CEO of IBM. Not exactly an easy thing to do. She was also one of the first women who became a member of the Masters or the Augusta National Golf Club. Eisenhower uh, gave a quote that I kind of uh, find fascinating. <clears throat> he said, what is urgent is seldom important. What is important is seldom urgent. So as a leader yourself, would you comment on that? Does does that make sense to you? Well, at any given moment, when you're in a crisis, it seems like it's very important. And then when you're not in a crisis, sometimes things can strike you. I know in my own case, when I think I've made a big mistake, get worried about it, later it turns out it wasn't that big a deal. And sometimes things I didn't think were a big deal, they came along and they kind of bite you in the behind. And you know, uh, you just can't always predict what's gonna happen. So Eisenhower might be right in that regard. And as to Eisenhower, I didn't interview him, of course, but I remember growing up, um, thinking what an old, old man he was to be president of the United States. And I looked it up recently. How old was he when he was elected? 62, which today seems like a teenager to me. Yes, it does. To me, too. Thank you. You do, too, for that matter. Um, now, humor, we, we talk about that here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop enough uh, because our man had a sense of humor. Uh, and he used that humor really laughing with people, not at people laughing at his own self as well. Uh, did any of these leaders speak about humor and how that helped them? Or if not humor, compartmentalizing uh, certain areas of their life? Well, some of them were able to do self-deprecating humor, which I think is the most effective. Uh, sometimes uh, people who have uh, ability to do some humor, really it's at the expense of other people, which I don't think is often the best. Um, Lincoln was a person who had self-deprecating humor, for sure. And I think uh, self-deprecating humor is a bit of a defense mechanism. It makes people realize you're not uh, too arrogant. It also makes people realize that you're approachable, but also it enables people to kind of connect with you more. And I think it's, uh, and, and also you might be masking a little bit of your insecurities in certain areas. Uh, so I think it's a very good defense mechanism. President Kennedy was as good as anybody at self-deprecating humor. But self-deprecating humor is something you can't write for somebody. I think if you have a self-deprecating humor style, you could, these ideas come to you. 
it's hard to give somebody who's fairly arrogant self-deprecating humor and have him or her read it and it works. It usually doesn't work. Yeah, it's more innate, I think, I agree. Um, let's talk about philanthropy a moment. Uh, you've met most of the people in this book through either board membership or through philanthropy. Uh, that, now, where does that urge for philanthropy come from in most leaders or anyone for that matter? I think most people recognize that they got lucky in life and therefore they should give back to society, which enabled them to get uh, to where they are. Uh, many people come to the realization, as I did, that there's no need to have staggering sums of money just to pile it up in your bank account or buy more art or more houses or more yachts or planes. It's kind of a waste of money to do that. So why not do something useful with it? And I think most people that I've interviewed who are wealthy have come to that uh, realization that giving it away is a much better way to spend one's time on the face of the earth than just piling it up so when you're dead, people can say, look how big his bank account is. Well, you talk about those with money uh, and philanthropy, uh, but what advice do you have or encouragement to those who don't have great wealth to be a great philanthropist? Are there other modes of philanthropy besides just money? Most of the multi-billionaires that I know, not all, but most, or a lot of them, I should say, are not very happy always. There are many billionaires that are tortured souls. They made a lot of money, but they're not happy. You know, they just aren't happy with their life, and that's, that's unfortunate. So what the lesson is, is money doesn't buy happiness. Everybody's heard that, but it's certainly true. The happiest people I know in life are people that have modest amounts of money, because they don't really care about money, and it's just not an important part of their, uh, their soul. Now, philanthropy is derived from an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. So you can love your humanity with, with uh, your ideas, with your time, uh, with your energy. And the most valuable thing anybody can give to anybody else is their time. You can always make more money if you're in the money-making business. It's not that complicated. But your time, you never can get your time back. Once you give it up, it never comes back. So I tell people that that's a very important part of our American society. When to Tocqueville came here, he kept saying he had a hard time getting to talk to people because they were always busy volunteering for things. They were, the country was a volunteer country. And that's because people here didn't have a lot of wealth then and they helped other people through volunteer activities. They didn't have money to give away, they gave their time away. And I think that's a very good thing for people to do. Um, public service is something that came up in the book. Uh, and certainly public service can be a form of philanthropy in a way. <clears throat> Jamie Dimon said that he'd like to be president, but it's not in the cards. Uh, Democratic Party, he said, is not looking for a multi-billionaire. Uh, but do leaders, we don't see, do leaders have a, a sense of wanting to be a public servant, president, for instance? Or for instance, what about John Quincy Adams, a president who went back into Congress? Uh, how, do any of them have goals of public service in that regard? I think everybody uh, wants to do some type of public service. Now, going into the government has lots of constraints and lots of uh, challenges these days. But I think Jamie Dimon has said if he could be president of the United States, he'd love to be that and he'd be very good at it. But getting there as a Democratic nominee would be difficult as a former, as the CEO of uh, J.P. Morgan, probably. But I think uh, everybody wants to give back to their country. It's an interesting phenomenon. People say, they're prepared very often to die for their country. You've heard that expression, I'm ready to die for my country. And obviously a lot of people do in military combat uh, when we are at war. Very few people say I'm prepared to die for my university, die for my neighborhood, die for my state. What is it about the country? Well, people recognize that in society, the way it has evolved, that a country is a more important commodity or organ form of organization than a city, a neighborhood, a state and so forth. And people are prepared to make sacrifices for it. And if they can, they'd like to make the country better through some type of public service. And I think everybody has that, not everybody, but most people have that gene. They do it in different ways. Sometimes you can work in government. Sometimes you can um, give philanthropic gifts to government related things. Sometimes you can be a volunteer. There are many different ways to do it or military service, which of course is the ultimate way that you can serve your country because you're active, you are prepared to give your life up in your military service. You speak a little bit about retirement in these interviews uh, in the book. And uh, my father was a psychiatric gerontologist. And he taught me from a tadpole up that one should re not retire from something, but must retire to something. 
And that's a lifelong achievement. You have to have curiosity and interest outside of maybe what you're doing to make money and to make a livelihood. Um, retiring to something. You, most of those in, the, in here come to their retirement, such as even though it's maybe it's not retirement, just mainly philanthropy or some other form of service. Do they come to it after they're done or have they prepared themselves for retirement years, even though some don't like Warren Buffett? Well, some people have done things while they're in the peak of their career. Um, Colin Powell would do some things in, let's say, in, 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 that were philanthropic uh, in the peak of his career. Others have done that as well. But I, the key point I think you really are making is that uh, retirement is a concept that was invented more or less, I guess, in recent you know, century or so. But that's because people live longer. Uh, people didn't, when people lived the average, when li the average life expectancy in the United States in 1900 was 49. So, you know, people didn't think about retiring. They kind of died uh, relatively early as a general rule of thumb. So when people got to be older, uh, they had to think about doing something else. The body and the mind doesn't work quite as well. So they called it retirement. And the theory was you would have an opportunity to do things that you didn't, couldn't do before. But my own view is that when you do retire, you run the risk that something in your body says, uh-oh, I don't need to be here anymore, I can check out. And so I have read about people, I know people, sadly, who retired, and I'm not exaggerating, a week or two or a month later, they drop dead. Exactly. So I live, a, a, I'm afraid of dropping dead if I start uh, slowing down, because I'm afraid, I think my body recognizes I need to keep going, and if I slow down, all of a sudden the body will say, well, I don't need to be here anymore, and all of a sudden, boom. Um, you, you, I'm gonna go back to, uh, uh, beginning of your career, uh, before your real career, you were uh, with Jimmy Carter in his campaign and briefly in the White House. I'm just curious because we have letters and books signed by Jimmy Carter that come through here since we specialize in the presidency, not to mention the Civil War and Lincoln, but uh, that uh, what sort of a leader was Jimmy Carter? Well, Jimmy Carter, uh, has, there's an excellent biography. The best biography I've written, I've read about him is now out by, by a man named Jonathan Alter, who wrote a comprehensive biography, and he had access to Carter and Carter's papers that had not been disclosed before. Carter was a very smart man who wasn't yet experienced in the federal government, and he was used to, as an engineer, engineering things himself, and he kind of didn't have uh, the reliance on his staff that much, and, he, and, and as a result, he tried to do too many things, and he didn't prioritize. Uh, but in the last 40 years, what he's done with his life is extraordinary. He's written 35 books, uh, obviously done election monitoring around the world, helped eliminate guinea worm and river blindness, among many other things he's done. So it's an incredible life in the last 40 years. If anybody I've met in recent decades as a Renaissance man, it's probably Carter. Of all the things he's done, it's quite remarkable. But his presidency is not well regarded by historians. On the other hand, if you go back and look at what he actually tried to do and some of the things he did do, it's amazing. The, the uh, Camp David Accords, for example, Panama Canal Treaty Resolution, Department of Energy, Department of Education, Civil Service Reform, uh, so many things he did, but he didn't get credit for it because he wasn't good at taking credit for it. And of course he had the hostage problem in the end, he could never overcome that. Well, let me, uh, for those who may not have heard the question was, do I think the airplane has uh, kind of changed Washington so much because people don't stay in Washington anymore, they go home on weekends and therefore members don't bond with each other the way they did before. Um, I think in one respect that is true. On the other hand, uh, when airplanes came along, members would go on what's called uh, CODELs, congressional delegations. They would go around the world uh, on what people might call junkets, but they actually bonded with each other but because they've been criticized as junkets, they don't do them so much anymore. I think the bigger problem is not the airplane, but it's two other things. One is the need for money. Because money is so important for members of Congress, they now spend, I would say, 40 or 50% of their time raising money. And they have to do it by making calls, going to events and so forth, and therefore they're not in Washington as much. It's a relentless effort. And why do they need the money? For three reasons. One, you wanna get reelected, it helps. Two, you can buy leadership positions and favorship, favor with other people if you give them money to their campaigns. So you, you help other members who need money and you can need money to give money. And the third thing is, and this is very, maybe not be uh, as well understood, but if you have a lot of money in the bank, it can scare people away, even if you're not spending it. 
And uh, so they raise a lot of money. Secondly, social media. There are no secrets anymore. Everybody knows everything. Everybody is a critic of everybody. And so it's very hard for them to socialize with people from the opposite party. They get criticized for that. They have to spend half their time raising money. Those are big factors as well. David, thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thanks very much for taking the time to interview me. Yes. Th thank you very much, David. And thank you for watch to everybody out there for watching A House Divided, coming to you from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. The book we have been talking about is David Rubenstein's How to Lead. And you can get this book, you can order this book from alincolnbookshop.com. It will come to you with a, signed, a book plate signed by David Rubenstein. And, uh, and we thank you all for watching. And we'll see you again next time on House Divided.